thank you first of all for coming to the session. I think you'll learn, you'll be able to get a lot of information to share with your customers. My particular uh, presentation is kind of slanted toward the marketing. How many of you actually sell cheese? So as you can see by this slide, I am a health professional. I am definitely not in the cheese business. I don't make cheese. I don't sell cheese. I'm not interested in stirring cheese. I don't do anything with cheese except enjoy it. So it's simple. I am not in the cheese business at all. And I worked hard, very hard, to present on this presentation to collect the latest research for you to use. So it is my gift to you. But it really goes two ways. What I've learned from you in the past year is a gift. I found that cheese professionals have interesting connections. We both lift weights. This guy's definitely working harder than her. We have a, a purpose for weight. I know what to do with the lady on the right. I have no clue what to do with this. You do. And we all have a heightened sense of smell. Now the interesting thing about this slide is I had them switched. I had them on the other side and Max was getting sprayed. So I said, well, that won't work. So let's start with an important mineral, calcium. We absorb only 30% of the calcium in our food. 90% of it is actually stored in the bones and teeth. It's important to consider the bioavailability rating. The bioavailability rating, I'm, calling, I'm going to call BV. It's easier to say. It's important because it is defined as a body's ability to absorb and utilize nutrients. Some of you are taking notes. That's cool. So in compar comparing the BV ratings of foods, you'll notice something interesting, that dairy food is absorbed better than other food. For example, cow's milk is absorbed between 30 and 35 percent, the calcium in cow's milk. The calcium in yogurt and cheddar is 32 percent. And in spinach, guess what it is? Five percent. So I just learned that when milk is treated, heat treated, calcium is reduced as a result of the loss of an uh, enzyme cause called phosphatase. <clears throat> that enzyme actually enables calcium uptake. So my point is that people who may believe that calcium that they're getting in food is well absorbed, when actually it isn't if, it's, if the product is pasteurized. So uh, Dr. Went just mentioned something to me, that new literature shows that women can get plenty of calcium in their real food, so supp supplementation may not be necessary. So I want to just point out here, make sure your customers know that raw cheese is better in this particular area. So yeah, cheese is the ultimate diet food. So let me just po point out why this statement that cheese is the ultimate diet food is important for you to share with your customers. First of all, let's consider some relevant points. Two-thirds of Americans consider themselves overweight. 25% of men are on a diet right now. And 32% of women are on a diet right now. So we're interested in losing weight. If you average those two, 28% of the people are thinking about it. So you're potential customer base is large in this area. I don't expect them to come into your shop and say, hey, you know what, i got to lose 30 pounds. My doctor's really mad at me and, you know, I've got to lose some weight. Will you please advise me? They're not going to depend on you to be their nutritional consultant, right? But it's important for you to understand as, as sellers of cheese that they are thinking about it, although they may not be talking about it. So Max wanted me to make, make sure you understood this is the case. The expanding waistline in America is not cheese related. So you know why cheese is so satisfying. Everybody knows it because it tastes so good, right? But there's more. Let's take a quick look at physiology and to find other answers. Number one, the fat in cheese is helpful in moderating our appetites. Dietary fat is triggered by the release of hormones called um, 
leptin and cholecystokinin, kinin, something. Anyway, dietary, this leptin is fat, found in the fat cells, and the other one is found in the small intestine. Now, the importance of these two is that they actually create a sense of fullness in the brain. So the brain and the gut are talking to each other, they're communicating, and when, when as you get more cheese in your system, you all of a sudden you go, oh my gosh, I'm full, I don't need any more. But it doesn't take much volume, right? I have found that very little cheese is satisfying. So that's a good message. <clears throat> one of, let me go back just a second here. Just remember that the release of these hormones is just one of the ways that cheese can help us lose weight. So how many of you have seen this chart or something like it? So let's take a look at glucose. Cheese slows glu glucose uptake. And I'm not going into physiology of it in great detail, but when you see this spike in your blood glucose, that is not a real good thing for your body. You don't want that. You want a flatter response. So let's look at insulin. Insulin plays a key role in the regulation of blood sugar, and most people know that steady levels are optimal. You don't want drastic spikes in your blood sugar. And if you have any knowledge of diabetes, you, you totally appreciate this fact. To put it simply, insulin production is kind of like a thermostat. thermostat. When blood glucose rises, insulin is produced. When, when, when it falls, and less insulin is needed. Since cheese is super low in carbs, carbohydrates, the glucose response would actually be less severe than what you see here. So if, it, if this were related to fat, it would be a flatter line, which is optimal. <clears throat> so the good news is that the fat in cheese slows down this process and it maintains a steady flow of glucose. And that is good. Remember, steady is good. So this zigzag pattern is bad for those of us who skip meals. And unfortunately, I'm really good at that. I'm working on it, working on it. But this zig this zigzag thing right here, for those of us who wait three or four hours to eat, how many of you actually do that? Uh-huh, okay. So um, if, you, if you do this, what's happening is you, your brain starts to get fuzzy, you can't think clearly, and you get grumpy, right? And you can't make good decisions. It's not your brain's fault. You should have eaten earlier. All right. <clears throat> so for years, Max has been beating the drum to his favorite mantra, cheese is a near perfect food. How many of you have heard that or read it in his books? Okay. Well, he is right. He's right about that. Add this one to your list. Cheese is a complete source of protein containing all of the essential amino acids. We're not going into the definition of that, but it's important for you to understand that it is a, an essential, it is a complete protein source. Now, do your customers care about this? Actually, they do. 85% of people who claim to be trying to uh, lose weight or go on a diet are mainly concerned about protein. I was shocked when I read that. For decades, we've been told to eat low-fat food. Now, most of you are too young to remember that, but let me just say this. I've spent most of my career dealing with this mantra. We are, have been told to eat low-fat foods and I want to show you this chart that shows some interesting lines. The green line shows the decrease in butter. And the red line shows the increase in what is called salad oil. That's a variety of, of oils, okay? Now, if you'll notice the spike here, this uh, vertical line, what year is that about? Yeah, so my point is in the 80s, we got a really bad message. We had a lot of messages that says, you know, eat low fat. And we followed their instructions. This shows a similar response. Um, we worked really hard to modify our, di our diets based on this information that we got in the 80s. 
The American Society for Nutrition, published in 2011, shows that the most striking modification uh, during the last century, actually, was the 1,000-fold increase in the consumption of soy oil. Now, that's an important graph. So the drastic incline here is a very bad thing. So let's talk about milk. How many of you are farmers? Three. Three farmers out of all these cheese people. Hmm, they must be working. So notice the purple line representing the low fat and the whole milk in yellow. Look at that. What is what year is this? Can you show me what, what year is this? Yeah, so here we go again with the 80s. I call it the great fat scare of the 80s. Chronic diseases. They are thought to be behavior-based. Does that make any sense to you? Chronic diseases, behavior-based, meaning we have a lot of choices. They're also considered to be 80% preventable. So let's, let's talk a little bit about um, cheese and its high fat, high sodium, high calorie kind of perception. Because of that, it's on the danger list. People don't believe that it's healthy. So is eating cheese a risk factor for diabetes? What do you think? What? Correct. So evidently you read the same studies that I have because it is the answer is no. In fact, a study published just last year showed a, uh, an inverse relationship between di type 2 diabetes, yogurt, and, and cheese. Inverse. I have something else to say about this regarding what the CDC is telling us, the Center for Disease Control. They're still, they told us since 1980 what the, the uh, rate of diabetes has increased 167 percent. Some of you were born in 1980. Since you were born, the rate of diabetes has in, increased 167 percent. Now, that's really bad news. 50 years ago, type 2 diabetes was an old person's disease. Now, our children are at risk. Children are getting diabetes. In addition, the American Dietetic Association claims that 7 million people are diabetic and don't even know it. So this undiagnosed population needs your help. They need your products. So how many of you are in marketing? Share this with your marketing team. It's a very good uh, fact. When we think of cholesterol, we automatically think of heart disease. After all, we've been told this for 50 years. However, lately, some researchers and some writers just completely disagree. So for this presentation, we are going to only talk about clogged arteries. All right, so here's my favorite slide. This diagram shows the buildup of plaque, a thick, waxy stuff substance that forms an artery wall. This right here. Again, here's the biology book. Everybody's seen this picture. This process takes years to develop, and it looks like just a kind of accumulation of yellow, gooey stuff that's in the arteries. It's important to know that it's an inflammatory process. It's also important to know that this process is a good thing. It starts out as a good thing. Kind of like cutting your finger. You get inflamed, it gets well in two days, and bada bing, you're gone. What I want to say is that when inflammation becomes chronic, this process continues and disease conditions develop. Here's an interesting thing to, to note. Reducing inflammation is an important strategy for good health, and nutrition is a part of the solution. So, does dietary cholesterol clog arteries? The answer is no and no. Results from the British Medical Journal, published in February of 2013, February of this year, 
showed that substituting <coughs> safflower oil in place of saturated fats increased death from all causes. <coughs> I think it's time to reevaluate old information. So let's go back to Dr. Sinatra, who's been practicing cardiology for 40 years. Dr. Sinatra says that the real causes of heart disease are inflammation, oxidation, stress, and carbohydrates. What is missing? What is missing here? The evil word fat, right? Did I hear you say fat over here? Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, so fat and cheese is not an issue. The dietary fats, dietary fats don't accumulate on our waistlines. Cheese does not make us fat. So how many times have you heard this mantra? For those of you over 40, you probably heard it for a very, very long time. We were advised to replace butter, cream, whole milk, really good stuff with processed vegetable oils, shortening margarines, and butter-like spreads. Remember that? I not only remember that, I lived it for at least 30 years. Surprise, I'm still alive. As you can tell, I'm uh, really into this fat thing. Cheese is high in saturated fats, yes, but so what? A review of 21 studies showed that uh, they observed over 300,000 subjects for up to 23 years. Showed no link between dietary fat and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. This was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. That is an important slide to remember. A growing number of experts agree with this. How many of you have heard of William Costelli, or George Mann, or Mary Enoch? Let me just say that these experts are in agreement about the, the lack of the link of saturated fat and heart disease. These people deny any association. I want to quote Dr. Mann, Dr. George Mann, who was with the Framingham Heart Study for many years. His, this is high voltage. He says, he calls the, the whole approach to low fat the great diet heart scan and the greatest scientific deception of our time. This man, this man spent 26 years studying the relationship between fat, cholesterol, and heart disease. How many of you heard, have heard of Dr. Walter Willett? Dr. Willett says the problem is carbohydrates. Fat is not the problem. The media loves to write about the evils of trans fats, and rightfully so. But they rarely cover the natural ones. So the natural trans fats come from ruminant animals, and as you probably know that. But do your customers know this? The unnatural ones, the hydrogenated, highly processed trans fats, are not just bad. They're really bad. Avoid them. Finally, there's a consensus in the media. Finally, there's a consensus. Trans fats are the evil ones. Everyone knows about omega-3 fatty acids. Okay, and you associate fatty acids, these fatty acids, with these sources. Whole water fish, fortified eggs, grass-fed animals, flaxseed, walnuts, and cheese. And so that's something I wanted to add to that slide. We need to be aware of both types. So the fact is that both types are needed for cellular membrane function. The problem is that the ratio of omega-3s and 6s is really messed up. Most people don't know this. Okay. So I want to highlight number 3 and number 4. Omega-6 fatty acids are associated with inflammation, and they're also found in highly processed food, especially carbohydrates.
key word here is essential. See that not there? That means that we cannot produce it in our bodies. We cannot manufacture them. We need to add them to our diets. Let's look at omega-3s. Here are some benefits. Brain function, especially after 45. How many of you are 46 and older? Let's see. How many of you have farms that have grass-fed animals? But your customers need to know this. If they have a choice between buying products from grass-fed animals and non-grass-fed animals, share this with them. These, the GFAs, have five times more CLAs, conjugated little a acids, than the other ones. People with the highest levels of uh, CLAs have, have, in one study, had 50% less risk of heart disease. CLA-rich foods help fight cancer, boost immune function. They're not found in, they're not a good source. CLAs are not usually found in um, non-fat products. They're, so in other words, non-fat products aren't really rich in CLAs. Also, they're not found in bottles. CLAs reduce, help reduce our waistlines and reduce inflammation. Yeah, we've, we've been fooled. This campaign was launched a few months ago. How many of you have seen this? Okay. Um, let me ask you a question. I'm a health person, and this bothers me a lot. Does this bother you? Yes. It, does it offend you? Yes. The sciences can be very confusing. So a lot of the science is based on, mm, I don't know, junkie cheese? I don't know what they call it. But the true science that, that's associated with the raw milk cheeses is, is really different. When, when Max told me about this article, I braced myself because I knew that he was trying to stir up something, and it's true. With the title like How Junk Food Can End Obesity, One Must Be Prepared. The writer claims that processed foods can save us if the foodies get out of the way. Look at this. Right here. I did not make this up. So, thanks for the little prod there, Max. Here's the thing, here's my response. We are in the way, are you serious? The, look at this. Wholesome foodie canon is fantasy and as a solution to the national PC epidemic, it's a dead end. Now, if I were a better writer, I could launch a second career because this is in Texas, we call it something, but I'm just going to be polite. I'm going to say, not true. <laughs> I don't know many of you people outside of Texas, but I just spent 13 months, 12 months, on what is called the Texas Cheese Tour, where I go all over the state interviewing cheesemakers, retailers, farmers, writers, chefs, etc. And what I've learned has changed my life. The world's pace is frantic and is driven by the clock. But your approach is different. It seems like you are less interested in the tick-tock of a clock and more interested in time. I love that about you. So if I had to put a message in the closing of my presentation, I thought it would be a cheese is good nutrition, which is, I think, cute for marketing. But most importantly, it's eat and enjoy cheese without guilt. It is, in fact, a nearer to perfect food. 